Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell and I'm the senior minister. It's my joy to share with you some announcements today. We begin a new Sunday school class this morning and uh, I'll be teaching that for the summer. We'll be using Maxie Dunham's wonderful study, Coping as Christians. This is a great study. Every church I've used it in has loved it. It's about how we deal with just all those daily problems that come up like interruptions and uh, broken relationships and how our faith helps us deal with those uh, all those kinds of challenges we face. That's Sunday mornings in room 102 during the Sunday school hour. Come and join us for Children's Logos this June. We're doing that every Wednesday night at 4.30. Last week we were talking about how God uh, makes a home for all creation and we made birdhouses. We're having lots of fun, great snacks, good times. Wednesday nights at 4.30. Call the church for more information. The youth group has a cookout June 12th, and uh, that's always a lot of fun. It'll be out at the Birds uh, Ranch, and we invite you to come and be a part of it. Check the church newsletter for more information. Vacation Bible School begins June 13th, and we have every night a wonderful uh, ministry plan for our children, and we hope that you'll sign up, contact the church office, to sign up and you can sign up online. And then finally, our Youth League for Camp, Youth Force, June 19th. A lot of great things happening. What a wonderful and busy time at our church and what a great day for worship. Thank you for joining us at Centenary. Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. We are so glad to have all of you as we celebrate Pentecost together this Sunday. I have a friend and she told me that uh, Saturday morning she got up and watched in the living room where her husband was sitting watching TV and she held up a cockroach and a little piece of toilet paper and said, look what I found in our kitchen. And he marched in there and he scrubbed and he cleaned and he sprayed for the next four hours and she was so grateful for the work that he did. And then she smiled at me and said, next week I'm going to put the rubber cockroach in the bathroom. <laughs> Whatever motivated you to be a part of worship today, we are so delighted that you've chosen to worship with the Centenary family. It is Pentecost, so Pentecost means 50. The Jewish tradition, 50 days past Passover with a celebration of the harvest. For Christians, 50 days past Easter, and we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, that day when the leaders of the church, the apostles, were covered with what appeared to be flames of uh, tongues of flame, and there was a great wind. And uh, our very clever worship team, who has decorated so beautifully, has put up these red curtains, and they are being moved by the air of fans. Uh, so fire and wind still here and still present as we celebrate this great day. It's also communion today, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about that. In the United Methodist tradition, you're invited to the communion table if you seek Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church. 
You don't have to be a member of this denomination. There is no age requirement. You don't have to be confirmed. Anyone who seeks Christ is welcome. By tradition in our congregation, we leave little gifts of uh, an extra offering down in this basket, and that goes to feed the homeless and the hungry around us. We have several programs our congregation does feeding the hungry in our neighborhood, and that offering funds those ministries. When you come forward, if you would, simply hold out your hands like this, and uh, the communion servers will break off the bread. We try to do it like Jesus did at the Last Supper. We break off the bread, we dip it in the cup, and then we'll place it in your hand. It also has the advantage of not all, not all of us handle the bread that way. So, uh, and you're welcome to spend time at the prayer altar if you'd like. We hope that you'll come. We hope that this will be a powerful day for you. Let's greet Jesus Christ now in our praise and worship. Please stand and join me. morning. Let the musicians make music. As we celebrate the victories of the Lord, the friends of God are like the light of the sun. Because the, the Lord, Lord brings, brings them, them peace. seated. Well, there's nothing more nerve-wracking than being up here with my voice trying to sing, knowing that it, the microphone is on. That's, uh, that's kind of intimidating for me. All right. Christ our Lord invites us to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, 
and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proved God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we are gathered here in peace, let us now share the sign of peace with those around you. Some of you can't see him, but there's the cutest little guy up in the balcony, and he is waving his flame and having a great time. And I just want you to know that as we pray, that's how God sees each of us, one of his beloved children. See, I talk to him, he talks back. That's a smart little guy. Let's pray. Lord, you do love us as your beloved children. You see us as we are. You love us anyway. Nothing we can ever do or say in our life can separate us from your love. In our worst moments, you still love us. On our best days, you love us. When we're close to you, you love us. And when we're far away, you love us. And when we fall down, you meet us where we fall. You claim us. You lift us and encourage us to get back up. And you love us. Make us a people, Lord, who love as you love. Send us out into the world to encourage others on their good days and especially on their bad days. To love them when they are accepted. To love them when they are rejected. To love them when they are victorious. To love them when they are defeated. To reach out our hand and say, get back up and I will stand with you. 
That is the true work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And this day we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit that we might love better and more and more deeply. It is in the name of the Savior we pray. Amen. It is now time for our offering. I think I caught him off guard. Lord, we are gathered here today to celebrate your majesty, your graciousness, and your outpouring of love for us. Let us respond with grateful hearts and the giving of not only our gifts, but of our time and our talent, so that this church and these people can continue this ministry, which is needed now more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture comes from Acts, second chapter, verses 37 through 39. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, for your children, and for all those who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. When I was a little boy, I wanted to be a boxer. I grew up in South Oklahoma City. Uh, down by the farmer's market there on the river, 
Uh, if you know the area where the big Ferris wheel is, Wheeler Park, that's where I grew up as a child. And uh, there at the farmer's market, on weekends, they'd have boxing matches and wrestling. And that was incredible entertainment for a little guy. My dad was an amateur boxer, and occasionally he'd be on the card, and I'd get to watch him box, and he won a lot of matches. He was one of those guys who was short and stocky, had a quick punch. It was just awesome to watch him. So I wanted to box too. And finally, my dad agreed, and so I, I started taking lessons. They put me in all this gear, you know, sort of like David when he went out to, to fight Goliath. And at first, he tried to do it in Saul's armor, you know, and he's walking. It was like that. But I sort of got used to it. And finally, I had my first match. And the thing that they teach you to do is when you go out, you're supposed to have your guard up, right? Somehow, I kind of forgot that. I was kind of stunned by all the attention, and I was nervous. And I just kind of stood there like waiting to see what would happen next. And the kid across from me, he had boxed before, and he knew just what to do. He wound up and he threw a punch that knocked me flat on my back. Now, I had all this headgear, protective stuff on and everything, so I wasn't hurt, but I was stunned. And I lay there flat on my back, none of this going the way I had pictured it in my mind. And I was so stunned and shocked, I didn't know what to do. I thought about crying, but that didn't seem like a good answer in front of all these people. I thought maybe if I just lay there long enough, they'd move on to some other boxing match and I could crawl off in the shadows. But that didn't happen either. And then I heard my dad's voice. He was down on the edge of the ring. He had this warm, warm baritone. And he was saying, get back up, Junior. Junior, get back up. And it was like a revelation. I didn't know that was allowed. I didn't know the rules that you do that. So I got back up. Now, this was a great movie, like Top Gun or one of those movies. I tell you that I went out and I won the match. But then I'd just be lying in front of Jesus and everybody if I told you that. Now, I got doused. I got wiped out. But eventually I did learn, and eventually I did win a lot of matches and had a lot of fun with it. But what I remember most from that day is my dad's voice. Afterward, my dad talking to me with, with, with no, uh, nothing negative, all positive. Son, you gave it a great try. You did your best. And my dad saying to me, you know, sometimes in life we get knocked down. Sometimes we don't see it coming and we get knocked down. The key is to get back up. I'd like to suggest to you that that's what Pentecost is really all about. On Pentecost Sunday, and I've done this six times in a row in this congregation, we typically preach about the wind that came sweeping through, right? And the sound of it. And, and we talk about the flames, the tongues of flame. The Bible says it appeared like tongues of flame over the heads of the apostles. And we've, the, the worship team's done a beautiful job to recreate that. They have the curtains here. There are little fans under the curtains moving them today. I don't know if you can see that. So we have wind and we have fire for you. We, we're covering all of the bases, right? And there's this incredible moment in, in which people can hear uh, the apostles speak no matter what their own home language is. And it's this incredible, powerful thing. 3,000 people become Christians and are baptized, etc. And we celebrate it as the birth of the church. It's not, in my opinion, it's not the birth of the church, but a lot of other smart people think it is. But sometimes I worry. I worry that, that, that we have this celebration and people walk out of the sanctuary on Sunday, they, they finish watching online, and they go, well, I never had any big thing like that happen to me. I never saw tongues of flame. I saw it on the Methodist cross, but I never have saw it in, in life. I never heard any big wind. I never got to speak in a different language. I must not have the Holy Spirit. I must, must not be a part of my life. I think there's another part of it, though. Those things are wonderful and powerful and represent the power of God's spirit that was promised to us as Christ ascended into heaven. But there's more to it than that. 
There's another aspect of the Holy Spirit I want to talk about today. The kind that the 99.9% of us experience, I think. And the best way to explain it is to talk about the man who preached on the day of Pentecost, Peter. You you may remember Peter's story. He he was living in a small town. He grew up in Bethsaida, and and then he moved to Capernaum. Capernaum's my favorite place on earth. If you came to me and said, Rob, I want to buy you a ticket today in a private plane. You can stay anywhere you want from, I'd go to Capernaum, the city that was the center of Jesus' ministry on earth. I can go stand in the synagogue on on the very spot where Jesus preached his first sermon. It's incredible. Plus, it's one of the few places in Israel that's shady and cool. Right? It's like going to the lake. He grew up there. He had a fishing business with a couple of the other apostles. And they were kind of successful in their own way there. We know now that there are sulfur springs right there in that area by Tagba and by Capernaum and Bethsaida. That there's, there's, there's these sulfur springs that, that change the water, purify the water, put a lot of minerals in the water, and that's where the fish come, come to eat, and that's where they could catch a lot of fish, and that's where they were. And he's there, he's kind of, think of him as a, as a small town guy, small town guy, living in a little town outside of Texoma, Lake Texoma, who's got a guide service on the lake. Right? And he's got a couple of boats and a couple of good old boat boy buddies, and they take people out fishing. And that, that's kind of what Peter was. You know, he didn't have a great education. He wasn't wealthy. He didn't come from a wealthy, powerful family or anything. He was living out in the backwoods in the northern part of Israel where he lived. That most Jews considered those folks barely Jewish because they had been hauled off into slavery and bondage, intermarried, kind of lost their, their pureness, you know, spiritually and stuff. That, that's the way other people looked at him. So he's kind of out in that outlaw territory, like Oklahoma, right? And he's running his fishing service there. When one day his brother brings this guy Jesus, and they meet, and Jesus takes him out fishing. And he has this amazing catch. And from that moment on, he's captivated by Jesus. And Peter follows Jesus. He becomes a part of Jesus' inner circle. Arguably, you could say he becomes Jesus' best friend. He becomes the spokesman for the disciples. And he's, he's brash, and he says what he feels without thinking a lot of times. And, and sometimes he's incredibly right, and sometimes he's incredibly wrong. And he has good days and bad days. One day he decides he can walk on water, and two steps into it he figures out, well, maybe I can't, right? He's a lot like us. He's maybe the the most human figure in the gospel stories. A guy you can latch on and say, yeah, I'm a lot like Peter. And he has this incredible ministry with Jesus. And it it all accumulates at a a place called Panos. Now, if you look at that up on the map map today, it'll say Banyos, because in Arabic, there's no P sound. Um, So it'll say Banyos if you're trying to find it. It's Caesarea, ancient Caesarea. Um, And it, 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 it was Panos, though, then because it's where you worship the god Pan. And it's these beautiful cliffs surrounding the headwaters of the Jordan. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful. Once again, a lake setting. You look in the waters, millions of little fish everywhere. Fresh spring water coming off of the mountains and the snow and the ice and and surrounded by these cliffs. Gorgeous area. Big cave there that the Greeks thought was the gateway to hell. And Jesus preaches a, a part of the sermon about that cave. And they're there, they're together. Then they're there for a reason. Because this is the place where where the Greeks used to worship. And so there are niches cut in the sides of the cliffs. You go there right now, you'll see see it. And and there were sculptures there of the gods they worshipped. And then then the Seleucids come on and do the same thing. Uh, The Romans will do the same thing in that spot. The Jews, when they rebel, they go there and they tear down those idols. And the Romans decide to teach the Jews a lesson. They take the Jewish leaders up on the cliffs there and throw them off so that they'll die and they put their Roman god idols back up and say, see, our god's more powerful than yours. That's where Jesus goes. It's totally out of his way. And he takes the disciples, and he's there with them, surrounded by all of these sculptures uh, of all the different gods, of all these different religions. And Jesus says to, to, to the disciples, who do you say that I am? The, the question every one of us has to answer If you join the church today, we'll ask you a question sort of like that. Will you follow Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? It it comes from this moment. 
Because in that moment, Peter, the fisherman, will make the very first profession of faith in Jesus Christ in history. Surrounded by all these idols from all the other gods of the world, Peter looks at Jesus and says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. He's the one who says that. And Jesus' response, of course, is upon this rock, his profession, upon this rock I will build my church. And since that moment, anybody who follows Christ has to make that profession of faith in some form. You're Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Messiah. It's this incredible moment. From this moment on, everything changes. They, 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 they're no longer a little sect following a, a backcountry rabbi. They become the genesis, the origin of what will become the church of Jesus Christ in the world. Millions of people will come to faith making that profession that Peter made in that moment. And you think to yourself, this guy's awesome. You know, he's like a boxer who never loses. He's up there, he's throwing the punches, he's winning every bout in one punch. I mean, Peter is amazing. Everything is incredible in his life. Until the cross, right? The cross changes everything. Jesus is arrested, tortured and beaten. And Peter, who was the first person to profess faith in Christ, denies Jesus once, twice, and three times, just as Jesus predicted. And then this Christ, who he had professed his faith in and proclaimed the Son of God, the Messiah, the promised one, is nailed to a cross and dies. And you talk about being down on the mat. Peter is obliviated. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that in your life where everything you believe is shattered and broken. But that's where Peter is. And you think it can't get worse. But then three days later, the disciples come and say, Peter, Jesus is alive. He's been resurrected. And Peter, he's asking for you. He wants to see you personally. I don't think I would have been very comfortable with that. I think I might have sort of packed up my stuff, my waders and my poles, and gone all the way back to Capernaum and started just fishing for a long time. Peter is called to join the disciples back at Capernaum, 16 feet from the doorstep of Peter's mother-in-law's house. About 30 steps from where Jesus worked great miracles of healing. And he meets Jesus there on the beach, and Jesus has a cookout for them. Because I always think Jesus is a good southern boy, and no southern boy is going to miss, miss the opportunity to have fried fish. Right back there where everything started for Peter, where he was called, where he was called from being a fisherman to being an apostle, right there Jesus has brought in the fish, gathered them, and having a cookout. And I always love this about the Catholic Church. I, I am so grateful to the Catholic Church for saving these religious sites, not letting them be turned into T-shirt stands and stuff. You know, it's a beautiful site. They, they have that site there. But it always strikes me as kind of comical because they have a big sign up there that says, no picnics on this beach. Right? Because everybody would want to come and eat there, you know, where Jesus ate with Peter and the disciples after the, after the resurrection. And they're there, and they're eating, and they're having this meal, and Peter's got to be running all this stuff through his head. My gosh, I ruined everything. I broke everything. I destroyed everything. What is Jesus going to do to me now? And there's this moment we call the primacy. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then Jesus does it again, right? He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And then one more time, like Peter's not getting it. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. 
Jesus to Peter, feed my sheep. Three times. One time for the first denial. One time for the second denial. One time for the third denial. Each denial, each betrayal of Christ, erased. And then Peter is restored and given the task of feeding the sheep of the world. Carrying on the mission of Jesus. Be clear, be pure, be focused, Peter. This is your job. Not the past, but your calling to what is to come. Right? Peter, you've left the past. Now, here's your future. Boy, that's a word for me today. I wonder if it is for you as well. That Jesus meets us, claims us, feeds us, nurtures us, forgives us, restores us, and sends us out to feed the sheep of the world. Whatever color, race, sexual orientation they might be. Feed my sheep. And then there's 50 days. 50 days, Jesus ascends into heaven, and Peter's got to weigh this stuff in his heart. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because Jesus has said, there's going to be a Holy Spirit. He's going to minister to you, Peter. And Pentecost comes. And who gets up to preach? Peter. The old fishing guide from rural Oklahoma is now standing on the steps of the capital of the country with thousands of people hanging to every word. Don't tell me that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. Peter, get back up. Peter, you can do this. In fact, sometimes the, the tradition is that, that they meet in the, in, in the upper room where they had the Last Supper and that's where all this happens. I don't think that's right because these are thousands of people. Where are you going to find thousands of people in Jerusalem on this holiday called Pentecost? You're going to find them at the temple. And 3,000 of them are going to be baptized. Where do you find a place to, to baptize 3,000 people in the city? Well, outside the steps of the temple are these little mikvahs, these little baptism things that you'd go down into, the Jews would go down into and bathe and purify themselves before they went into the temple. So here is this fisherman, uneducated, poor, standing on the steps of God's holy temple built by Solomon, rebuilt by Herod, preaching. And he preaches this incredible sermon. Peter, who's been fallen down, Peter, who's been knocked down, Peter, who's been reclaimed by the Spirit of the God, by the Spirit of God, and given a purpose in life. And he ends it with the words that, that Kelly read. I didn't make Kelly read all those countries and names. He's a really happy guy today. He just ends with this, and he ends with, with these words. They say, what should we do? What should we do, Peter? What should we do? And Peter says, repent. Now, if you grew up in a certain church tradition and you hear that word, you might not have a very positive feeling about it, right? Because sometimes that word came in some church traditions with a lot of hellfire and damnation. But you really need to hear it in the context in which Peter uses it, right? There's no church yet when Peter's preaching. There's no New Testament when Peter's preaching. He's preaching as a Jew who knows Jesus. That's how he's preaching. And the word for repent is shuf. It's a word that's used over a thousand times in Jewish scripture, what we call the Old Testament. You know, you've read a lot of Old Testament verses. It means a lot of things. But mostly it means return. All those verses in your English Old Testament that you read when God is speaking to Israel and he says, return to God. Return to the God who created you. Return to the God who loves you. When anytime you're, that's really the word repent, shuv in Hebrew. In fact, shuv in its rawest form means to return to the dust of the earth. It means to, to allow yourself to be broken down corpuscle by corpuscle, cell by cell, until you are nothing but dust. 
to let that old life fall upon the ground in dust. So that the Spirit of God may rebuild you, recreate you, and restore you. That's what Peter says on the day of Pentecost, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit to raise us up from the dust of brokenness and create new life in us that we might do the work of Jesus in the world feeding sheep. If you're looking for your purpose in life, you found it. That's it. And sometimes it comes with with a great roaring wind and tongues of flames. And sometimes it's a quiet voice, a steady voice that won't give up and keeps saying, get back up. Let me tell you what I mean. I had this great friend and he struggled with alcohol addiction his entire life, ever since we were in school together. He studied with, he struggled with it. It's destroyed his life. He's been married three times. Each marriage has ended in divorce. Each marriage produced one child. Each of those three children became addicted to drugs and alcohol. And and at our age, he he goes to church and he goes to AA, but he feels like his life is a worthless disaster. So one day he's sitting in church and the preacher is a little time before, you know, the service starts and he's making announcements. And he says, uh, our church has decided to start an AA group I need some volunteers to help start the group. And my friend is sitting on the back row trying to be as small and invisible as he possibly can be because he feels absolutely worthless and why should anybody even want to look at him at church? And he says, I'm sitting there thinking, God, no. And there's a voice inside of me saying, you can do this. He said, I've been sober two years, that's all. Two years at that point in my life. I think I can't even take care of myself. I've got nothing to offer anybody. But the voice keeps saying, you can do this. And so he goes to the first meeting, not as a leader, just as a helper. And he's there and he sits down. He tries to sit in a place where he hopes nobody will sit near him. And these two young men come in, these two young guys who are husbands and fathers. And they sit on each side of him. And before the meeting even starts, they're pouring out their hearts. Their lives are broken and shattered. Alcohol is destroying their marriages, destroying their relationships with their children, causing them to fall into great financial disaster. And they're pouring out their hearts to my friend. My friend's going, I don't want to hear this. He says, then I hear that voice inside of me. You can do this. Next week, he goes back. The guys come sit next to him again. Third week, he goes back. Those guys come and sit next to him. They want to talk to him. They want to hear, how did you do it? How did you get two years? What was your biggest struggle? What, how, did, how, what did you do when you felt like you were going to fail? In the middle of the night, you felt like you couldn't. What did you, what did you do? And my friend, every time saying, I don't want to talk about this. But the voice keeps saying, you can do this. Eventually, he became the sponsor for one of those young men. And then the sponsor for another young man in the group. And another And another, and now 15 years, he's been sober and helping with his AA group at his church, his Methodist church. You see, sometimes Pentecost is is tongues of flame and great wind. Sometimes Pentecost is a boy hearing his father's voice still from 55 years ago saying, get back up, Junior. Sometimes it's an alcoholic sitting in the back of the church hearing, you can do this. And sometimes it's a fisherman standing up before the world and saying, we can change the world. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
There's a part of the communion liturgy that uh, we say every time we have communion. It's part of the prayer. It's called the Epiclesis, and uh, it's a time when we invite the Holy Spirit to be present in this moment. Today, when I get to that, that part of the communion liturgy, I will invite you simply to raise your hands as a symbol of your desire to receive the Holy Spirit in your life. Will you join me now in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You deliver us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people and he, he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks, and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And now if you'd like to raise your hands and invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join in the Lord's Prayer, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes people will ask me, why is it that we talk about breaking the bread early in the great Thanksgiving 
and drinking from the cup. And then after the Lord's Prayer, we have this moment when we break bread and we lift up the cup. That beginning portion in the great thanksgiving is thanking God for what God has done for us in the past. Once we pray the, the, the ecclesias, the prayer of the Holy Spirit to come, we're in the presence of Christ at this table. And these events are in real time. We're no longer remembering. We are celebrating Jesus right here and what Christ is doing for us in this bread, this cup, and this meal right now. When Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you and for many. Because we eat of one loaf, we are one people. I am your Christ and I am with you now. On that same night, he took a cup and he lifted it up and he blessed it saying, this is the new covenant, the covenant of forgiveness. When we eat this bread, when we drink this cup, when you come to this table today and when you leave, you will be forgiven. You'll return to dust and you will be remade and you leave this table today pure in the eyes of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. May God in his presence bring Christ to be with us now that in the power of the Holy Spirit spirit. We experience the real and living Jesus. I'll invite those who are assisting to come forward. and blood of Christ. Yes, you. Drink the body and blood of our Savior. Carry the body and blood of Christ.
The work of the Holy Spirit is to build us up from dust, to restore us, recreate us, renew us, and send us out into the world to feed sheep. We invite you to respond today to the gift of that Spirit, the gift of Jesus Christ and the love of God. If you've never been baptized, it's a really important and crucial step in a Christian's life. It's following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. In the Methodist Church, it's an outward and visible symbol of an inward and spiritual grace. That is, it represents what's happening in your heart. And we invite you to come and be baptized. If you're not a member of a church, we'd love for you to have this as your church home, as the place where you live out your faith. We invite you to come and to join. And if you have any needs, a prayer need in your life, or maybe you'd like to rededicate your life to Christ on this Pentecost Sunday, please come. We're going to stand and sing for a few moments. You can wave your little tongues of flame. But if you hear that voice inside of you, respond. Will you come as we stand and sing? What a wonderful blessing to worship with you today. Uh, you may leave these for next year if you'd like, but if you need to go home and practice your technique, that you can take it home. I do the figure eight. I don't, you know, that's my technique, but whatever you need to do, uh, you know, Palm Sunday will come again and Pentecost and you'll need that technique. What a joy to worship with you. There's so many things going on right now for our children and youth. Keep them in your prayers and volunteer to be a part of them. And remember, we have a new Sunday school class that has started at 940 on Sunday mornings. Will you join me now in the sending forth? Be strong and be courageous. For the Lord our God is with us.